My name is Louisa Oliveira, and on behalf of the mayor and Alderman McWaters, who's here tonight, I want to welcome you all. This is the fourth meeting for the Nunziato Stormwater and Parks Project. I am a parks planner, uh, but there's a number of folks working on this, uh, both city staff and consultants, and I'm going to just take a moment to introduce them. We will be here until... Um, you need us to be here. So we have a, a lot to go through today, and I'm gonna ask that everyone hold their questions to the end, which again, you can write uh, notes, but we will be here uh, afterwards if people wanna speak with us one-on-one -on -one or to answer any questions. So with that, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. We have Brian Manter. He's uh, the Assistant Director of Engineering. We have uh, Kevin Butel. He is one of the consultants, a landscape architect who's working with me on the park from Stantec. Rich Rach is the Director of Engineering. And then we have Jill Lathan, who's the Director of Parks and Recreation. And we have Emerson Olander, who is another consultant also with Stantec, who is working on the engineering side of it. So these are really two projects that are happening in tandem. One, the Stormwater Engineering Project, and then the other, the Park Project, which I am working on. So in the last meeting, uh, I was not here, but uh, there was, definitely a message to kind of take a step back or what we heard was that folks needed a little bit more of an understanding of what this project is and and why this project is happening so we are going to kind of do that today and again it's somewhat complicated and i ask for your patience in getting through these presentations because it is not a simple um, problem and we want to thoroughly explain it so for today the meeting the goals of this meeting are to answer the questions. Again, we've had three meetings so far, and this fourth one, we, we really want to answer the questions. Why are we doing this at Nunziato? What's going to happen there? Um, how will we minimize the construction impacts? And how will the park be restored? So we really want to get through all of that, and then we want you to be able to ask questions and to have a discussion around that. Um, someone had asked how we, how we uh, let people know about these meetings, and this has been true from one, two, three, and this fourth meeting. We uh, send out a, a flyer and a communication to the communications department. They release a press release to newspapers. Uh, they put it on the city's website in the form of a neighborhood note. Elected officials get it. It's on the city calendar. It's on the Somerville City Cable Reel. Um, it's on the city's social media, on Facebook and Twitter, as well as another uh, account called Somerville Neighborhood Updates. If you don't follow that, it's another way to understand what's happening in planning and design and some of the things that are happening in different neighborhoods. Uh, it was also put on the city of Somerville's different Facebook pages in Spanish, Portuguese, and Creole. Uh, we have language liaisons whose job it is to communicate what the city is doing to language-specific communities and flyers were delivered to the neighboring properties posters were put up at the field and again as I mentioned there is an email list that you have signed in when you came in and you can get on that you can take that MailChimp and forward it to someone who they can join it that way or you can email me directly and I will put you on that list uh, so we, we really do make an effort to try to be as comprehensive as possible to get the word out um, I want to just review a very quick overview of what a typical project looks like. This is something that I use generally for my parks projects, but also applies to this project. Did anybody bring a pointer? Did we forget one of those? We did. That's okay. So we started off in 2016 with the first public meeting. And uh, we're really, the beginning component of a project is really the schematic design. It's a little bit different with the engineering because, than with the park project because there's very specific reasons why things are happening in the way that they are. And then design development through to construction documents where we're, cons we're compiling a set of construction documents that are followed and put out to bid. Someone bids on them, they win the bid, and then the construction process happens. So we're at the moment, um, at construction documents, and we have had you know the public process that runs really through schematic and design development and into construction documents has taken place in four meetings on the 21st of November, the 13th of February, the 22nd of February, and then again today. 
Uh, so this is just to give an overview of what the timeline is and how long it actually takes to build a park or to do a project, and this one even bigger because there's some extra elements to it. So the first thing we're going to do is really try to step back and answer that question of why Nunziato? What, what is this stormwater business? And uh, to do that, we're going to have Rich come up and explain the sewer and drain system. And again, I know this is technical. We're going to try to move very quickly. And it's not everyone's most interesting thing. I actually find it really interesting. But uh, if you have questions, if you could please take notes. Uh, again, there are pens there. Then we want to make sure that we're getting through all of them. So the first thing we're going to go through is what is the sewer and drain system? Then we're going to go through construction. How, how long is it going to take? What are we doing to make it less difficult for the neighborhood? And then we're going to talk about the, the restoration of the park. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rich. So there are a number of things that the city is currently doing to improve our sewer and drainage system and alleviate flooding and improve the level of service from our uh, infrastructure. Nunciato is one of these things that we're doing. And I want to put this in the context, the Nunciato part project in the context of everything that, that we're doing and why it is important in the context of all those different things. So we'll start with a little bit of geography. In the mid 1800s, very little of Somerville had been developed. And interestingly, we had water on three sides. Currently, we only have the Alewife to our west, the Mystic to our north. Prior to 1876, we also had Miller's River to our east. Miller's River extended all the way to what is present day Union Square, and Mill Pond filled most of the brick bottom area. In 1876, Miller's River was filled uh, in part of Cambridge and uh, Charlestown, and pipes were constructed by the Metropolitan District Commission, uh, MDC. So those pipes moved water from what was once a wetland and a river out of low-lying areas. Much like Cambridge and Boston and, and elsewhere in the country, development rapidly followed. What didn't change was the laws of physics. Water flows downhill. So on this map that sort of shows the, the elevations of different spots in Somerville, water runs from the red areas to the blue areas. So we run, if I can do this. Nah, it's not gonna work anyway. Um, like from uh, Prospect Hill and uh, Spring Hill down to Union Square, uh, from Winter Hill to Assembly Square, and from Tufts Hill to um, Davis Square area. In the 1980s, the Metropolitan District Commission, MDC, essentially turned into MWRA, the, Met, uh, the um, Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. Uh, so MWRA took ownership of those pipes. But those same pipes that were constructed in the 1800s are the only way to get water out of those low-lying areas like Union and Davis Square. So we'll step into a little bit of urban hydrology. Under natural conditions, pre-development, uh, most of rainwater gets absorbed by soil and used by vegetation. And that which doesn't get used by vegetation very slowly goes through the soil and makes its way to downstream areas, down to the, to the low-lying areas. By contrast, once you start development and increasing pervious area, roofs and uh, roadways, Rainwater doesn't have that opportunity to infiltrate into the ground and runs off very quickly. So this does two things. It increases the amount of runoff, the amount of surface water that you need to handle, and it increases the rate at which it moves. Whereas it used to move slowly over pervious areas, it now moves very quickly. So when it rains, as it did today, when you have a little bit of burst of um, extreme rain, that water moves very quickly um, over the land and through pipes. So to alleviate localized flooding, cities build pipes. In the 1800s, that consisted of a single pipe, a combined sewer, that would handle both the flow from residents and businesses, the wastewater, and the runoff. The more modern system has two pipes, where that those two categories are segregated. And the 
sewer pipes our size so that we can con consistently get wastewater from homes and businesses to a treatment plant for treatment and the surface runoff from the streets and, and um, homes goes into a separate drain to be moved away, usually discharged to a, um, a river or a lake. Well, what kind of system do we have? More than half of our system had been constructed by the turn of the previous century, and virtually the entire system and the entire of um, Somerville's developed area had been developed by 1940. So not surprisingly, most of our system is a combined system where we have the single pipe handling both wastewater and stormwater. Interestingly, we do have a large number of streets that have two pipes in them, but it's not really a separate uh, system. Because everything goes to MWRA uh, for treatment at Deer Island anyway, um, connections to these pipes don't tend to pay much attention to what their intent was. And even when you have two pipes in the street, they tend to recombine and do a combined sewer anyway. But it's good to know that we have these two pipe systems in some of our locations. It helps us develop solutions as we try to modernize the system. So it's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Now, the smaller pipes that are in front of your house, that are in your, your street, connect into bigger pipes. So we've got side street um, sewers and then what we call interceptor sewers. Kind of like you have like a side road go into a major highway. So small pipes go to big pipes, small roads go to big, big roads, same kind of idea. We've got three major interceptors in Somerville. In the northern section, we have Somerville's McGrath interceptor pipe that connects to the MWRA system in a pipe they call the Somerville Marginal Pipe. Southern end, or actually most of the, the city, is served by a Somerville interceptor that goes down Beacon Street, Washington Street, Washington and Somerville Ave, it connects into the MWRA's Cambridge Branch Sewer. On the western end, we have uh, the Tannery Brook Sewer in Somerville that connects to the Alewife Brook Conduit, again, another MWRA pipe that they own and control. So it's also good to remember what we have control over, our interceptors, versus what MWRA, Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, has control over, their interceptors. This gives us you know, three sub-areas. We've got the, the McGrath area in gold, the Alewife area in blue, and the Somerville Ave area in red. The purple area um, flips both ways, as it, as it turns out. Um, under most conditions, it goes into the red area, down Somerville Ave, and connects to the MWRA Cambridge branch system. Uh, under extreme rain events, it does have an overflow that allows it to go over towards the Alewife Brook system. Now with this knowledge, we can take a look at what the demands are on these different subsections of our overall system. So there's two main takeaways from this. One, over 60% of our flow is dependent on the Cambridge Branch MWRA sewer. And two, the sanitary component, the wastewater from homes and businesses, is a small fraction of what gets loaded into the system when it rains. For example, a, a storm that comes back every 10 years or has a one in 10 possibility of happening in any given year is 40 times larger than what the base sanitary flows are. So putting all these things together, you can see that one of our biggest engineering challenges is the Union Square area. We have 60% of our flow going down a pipe to a location on Somerville Ave near Medford Street that connects to an MWRA controlled pipe that Somerville shares with the city of Cambridge. It's also very important to remember that this then isn't just a problem for Union Square or the low-lying areas. It's a systematic problem. It's because our system is built to move flow and runoff from the high areas, 60% of our landmass, to this one location to be moved out of the city. It's an uphill problem causing a downhill problem. To sort of illustrate this, if you think about it, it is the, the, the sewer network is similar to a bathtub. It holds the water. And the rain falls all over the bathtub and contributes to the total amount of water in that bathtub. 
This bathtub is a little bit strange in that it has an uneven edge. One edge of the bathtub is lower than the rest. So while it's the same water hitting the entire bathtub, it's only spilling off onto your bathroom floor in one location. So on this, if you see the contour here, this is actually a, um, a cross section that goes down Summer Street, Bow Street to Somerville Ave. The bathtub fills up all at the same time, but on the high areas, on Summer Street and Bow Street, you don't see it popping out of the ground because you're up high. On the lower lying areas, Somerville Ave and Medford Street, you do see it popping out of the ground because there isn't as much of a bathtub edge there and it's spilling out. But it's all the same water coming from the city and contributing to the same problem. You only see it in a particular location because of the, the topography, the logistics. And it is indeed a serious problem. Uh, the city did a FEMA, uh, flood, uh, or a FEMA risk study um, that, that looked at different uh, hurricane force winds, earthquake, and identified flooding as one of the largest challenges, uh, or one of the largest risks that Somerville faces. Um, within the period of study, they found 12 different events that caused flooding, uh, and also identified 12 um, high-risk flood areas. All of them happen to be in those low-lying areas. <clears throat> they used FEMA modeling to determine what the um, monetary damage is from a 100-year flood and determined that it's on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in potential property damage from damaging floods. So this isn't a new problem. You know, we, we've had this system for over a century, and there, there has been some planning going in to improve the system. Um, the city has been pursuing uh, restoring the capacity that was essentially lost when the Miller's River was filled in 1876. Um, uh, most of the area now uh, th that is covered um, by what was once Miller's River is the um, MBTA, you know, the T, uh, rail yard. So that's one of the, the major things that cuts us off from now the Charles River. There's a little piece of the Miller's River that just kind of is a little edge on the Charles River. Um, so to get to the Miller's River, the Charles River, we have to go through the MBTA rail yard. Uh, and Discussions with MBTA for the past many years have gone nowhere to expand any capacity or, or get additional pipes out of the Union Square area. And that is until recently. With the Green Line extension, GLX, uh, when the Board of Aldermen and Mayor um, negotiated with GLX to help fund their shortfalls to make GLX a reality, one of the conditions on that was that they would provide capacity in their drainage system for the city of Somerville. This is probably the coolest thing that's happened since 1876 when it comes to the Miller's River. Um, and, and we are now in negotiations uh, with the MBTA to determine exactly what um, our capacity is and what the limitations of, um, of that capacity um, will be. But we, we are opening up a new corridor for flow that we haven't had uh, in, in almost two centuries. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a, an extensive study citywide that looked at sewer separation, because again, we have a combined system uh, that causes combined sewer overflows. Those are not good, uh, because in a combined system, you have sanitary waste mixed in with the stormwater, which when this, um, the system is uh, overloaded, overflows into um, the, the mystic into the alewife uh, and through an MWRA system also into the Charles. Um, so that study in the 90s and 2000s looked at sewer separation and effectively determined that it's cost prohibitive to do so uh, in Somerville. Despite that fact, um, it is still a goal of the city to increase level of service uh, from our sewer and drainage system and to segregate stormwater from the combined system. Uh, those goals are part of Summer Vision. I mean, Summer Vision does uh, have a lot of tension on it in terms of its development and redevelopment and, and social justice goals, but the sewer goals are in there. 
they're, they're not quite as uh, noted or sexy, but they're there, and I'm happy that they are. Um, so putting some of these things together, knowing that, that traditional sewer separation is cost prohibitive, we have to look at other ways of, of achieving these goals, of increasing service and reducing flooding. So in uh, 2013, MWH, which is now Stantec, um, did a study for the city of Somerville. And it shifted the focus to employ a approach to um, stormwater management that Cambridge had successfully been using for decades. So we're, we're essentially adopting a proven successful strategy. And the strategy shifts the focus from bigger pipes and end of pipe and bottom of hill solutions to distributed solutions. The problem happens, as I said earlier, that the rain falls over a large distributed area and gets into this closed system, and then you see problems at the bottom of the hill. The idea is to intercept the rain higher up in the hill before it gets downhill and causes the problem. Preserve the capacity in the system by intelligently managing stormwater. So how do we do that? Well, it's, it's runoff management. So a lot of it is green infrastructure, as you've probably heard of. Uh, you know, things like rain gardens uh, along the side of the road, uh, enhanced tree wells that do a better job than you know, what our current tree wells do of capturing and storing stormwater. Then there's also underground or, or surface or underground storage of stormwater, which is what Nociato is, uh, which is that big box um, as an example down there, which is why I said earlier, we do have some areas that have two pipes. In some cases, those two pipes, one of the pipes is a stormwater pipe, a storm drain pipe, which is separate from the combined sewer. It gets recombined, so we still have the current problems. But where we have separate stormwater pipes, we have an opportunity to store that stormwater in the system before it gets downhill and causes the problem. You don't want to com store combined flow because anytime you have a sanitary component to the water, you then have odor problems, you need odor control, you need to clean the tank after it's been used. So where we have the separate stormwater pipes, we have an opportunity. And so that was one of the things that the 20 uh, 13 MWH uh, planning effort did was try to identify all these opportunities that we have in that you know, two, two quarters of our or two thirds of our town um, that contribute flow to the Cambridge branch system. MWH looked throughout that area for anything we could do along those lines green stormwater infrastructure, stormwater storage, anything to keep stormwater segregated or hold it when we have the problem. But of course we have a very densely developed city. So the, those opportunities were very hard to find. And there were really only eight areas and in those eight areas we were able to, to, to develop some sub alternatives. So we really had like, like 11 projects that we could evaluate. And of each of those 11 uh, projects, uh, we did cost estimates uh, to determine what it would cost to build that. And they did hydraulic modeling to determine if we built this, what would be the flood reduction benefit in those low-lying areas. And then we looked at those projects through two lenses. One, what is the total flood reduction from that? You know, is, is, is this gonna be an impactful thing to do or is it uh, just a drop in the bucket? And then, what is the cost effectiveness of it? What is your cost per gallon to do that project? The conclusion was that we, we really only had three and a half very good projects filter out of those 11 potential projects. Um, Lincoln Park uh, stormwater management was found to be very cost effective. It's a smaller scale, it doesn't have as big an impact on flooding, but it's quite cost effective. So the city is doing that right now. The um, Lincoln Field is under uh, construction for park improvements and we're incorporating those stormwater controls into that project. Uh, the one that has the biggest impact is the Somerville Ave drain, um, but it's also quite expensive. The city is also uh, pursuing that project, and we will be presenting to the Board of Aldermen starting on Thursday to discuss that project and funding for that project. The Nunziato project that we're talking about right now was found to be the most balanced. It has a large benefit in terms of flood reduction, and it is 
and terribly, terribly efficient, terribly meaning very good, <laughs> um, you get a lot of bang for your buck out in Oceano. Um, a similar project could be done at the Conway rink, um, but it has, if you build a tank of similar size to Nuziato, it's only half as effective in terms of flood reduction, um, or it would cost twice as much for the same uh, flood reduction. So we're kind of keeping that one in our back pocket. It's not entirely off of our radar, but in terms of our overall triage and preference of, um, of projects, uh, we're not actively pursuing that one. We have other ones in the queue before that one. And again, no other projects out of all the ones that we evaluated were found to be cost effective or, or have a, a substantial benefit that's worth pursuing uh, out of all of that, that area. So what's special about Nuziato? So Nuziato uh, has, has a few things. It's just outside of where the flooding occurs and it's just uphill from where the flooding occurs. So we can intercept the, the flow the stormwater flow and store it at the right time at the right location. It also happens to be a, a, a city owned location where we already have control. So we, we don't have a, a um, property um, procurement uh, cost associated with it. And we can build the tank underground and preserve the use of the field once we're done. So it's not a land use change. It's, it, ultimately, it's not a designation change. So we've gone to the big picture. We've drilled down a little bit to Nuziato. I want to take a step back and then now put this in the context of what we are doing uh, moving forward. It is a complex problem that we face in the city because we have a complex system. And there isn't a single thing that we can do that will solve all the problems. We need to have a number of different projects knitted together. Green stormwater infrastructure, stormwater storage tank, sewer separation and infiltration and inflow control, and a new stormwater outlet. All of these things have to be pieced together to get to the ultimate solution. And we've developed a strategy that does that. And it's been ongoing. The Beacon Street tank was constructed about 10 years ago. It was actually constructed by the city of Cambridge and turned over to uh, the city of Somerville for operation because it benefits both cities. It does the same thing. As I say, Cambridge has been using this strategy effectively for over a decade, managing and controlling stormwater. So this was almost our pilot program. Uh, the tank is right out in front of Star Market. You wouldn't even know it's there, uh, but it, it effectively manages stormwater in that low-lying area. That area of Beacon Street used to flood. Uh, it floods a lot less now. Uh, when Mass Highway uh, reconstructed uh, the western end of Somerville Ave from Porter Square to Bow Street and Union Square, uh, the city did have the foresight to include in that project a separate drain in that area. So we have, we have created a locally separated system under Somerville Ave. We're extending that right now with the construction that is underway uh, in Cedar Street. Gioso is just remobilizing, so we'll, uh, we'll see them out there again in the coming weeks. That locally separate system is being extended from um, Somerville Ave up Elm and up Cedar Street to Highland. Um, with the focus of alleviating some localized flooding problem on a, a low area of Cedar Street, but it's the same basic concept. We are, as I said, in Lincoln Park and other ones like Chucky e. Harris and Symphony Park, incorporating stormwater controls in all of our park redevelopment projects. Now moving forward, those are all things that have been constructed or are under construction. These are now the projects that we're um, actively pursuing right now. We've got Nuziato. We've got the Somerville Ave drain and the uh, GLX um, drainage connection. Again, that, that piece where we can tie into the MBTA drainage system and get a new outlet for stormwater. We have an ongoing requirement for any developers. Um, when a developer uh, is putting in a new project or redeveloping a project, and if their um, wastewater contribution to the system is, exceeds a certain threshold, we require of that developer to contribute to a fund that the city administers to um, remove stormwater 
from our system at a four to one offset. So developers are essentially paying their share into this strategy. Once we've built these um, pieces, uh, the Nutsiata tank, the Somerville Ave drain extension, and the connection to the MBTA, that then opens up the next phase of things that we're able to do, which is targeted sewer separation to optimize the use of the tank, the drain, and the GLX connection to feed more stormwater, more clean stormwater into these stormwater control um, measures to keep stormwater out of the combined system uh, and alleviate flooding. So it's all part of a patchwork. All of these projects need to proceed together to achieve the goals. Um, and it is important to know that these goals really only get, uh, we're targeting a 10 year level of service. This isn't um, complete disaster relief. If you take a, away any one of these pieces, we're not gonna even achieve our 10 year level of service goal. Um, we wanna march towards higher and higher levels of, of service and we need all of these projects in concert uh, to get there. So now let's uh, turn our focus back to um, Nutsiato. The past presentations are out there. I see most people have been reviewing them, but just ever so quickly, uh, just to orient everyone to what we, is we're talking about. It is a stormwater storage tank, 1.6 million gallons, that we put underneath the park. Um, it diverts stormwater from the locally separated uh, Summer Street drain, holds the stormwater there during the rain event, and then pumps it out from a pump station once the rain is, is gone and the pressure on our bathtub is alleviated. We also incorporate green stormwater infrastructure into the park design. Uh, we ultimately have uh, park restoration. We're also doing roadway improvements uh, around there for a couple of reasons. One, to control the stormwater. Two, because it's the right thing to do. It is a, two to th uh, it is a three to four year project. Um, it's going to take two years to construct the tank uh, and another year to restore the park. Given, or, or depending on what time of year it is that we begin this project, uh, impacts uh, how long the fields are shut down because we have to have a full growing season before we can reopen the park to beneficial use for athletics. Um, so depending on when we start is when we can actually finish this. So that is the overall context of the project. Uh, we're now, uh, Emerson's gonna uh, step through what it is we're going to do during construction uh, to minimize the impacts to um, those of you who are near it. Hi everyone. <clears throat> uh, again, my name is Emerson Olander. I'm a professional engineer with Stantec. And um, I had an opportunity to present at the last meeting. If you've got the Meeting number three handout, you'll see a lot of photographs that we compiled that generally show um, what the construction is going to look like, the type of facilities that are gonna be installed. When we um, had that discussion, a lot of the questions came back. There was a lot of concerns about you know, how impactful this construction was going to be. And so we wanted to put together a few slides to really help um, the neighborhood understand what mitigation measures we've already incorporated into the design um, and, and controls for construction to help lessen the burden of this project as it's being built. Can you speak a little louder? Yes, yeah, sorry, is there? Okay. Um, so the first thing that we've done is all throughout the design process, which began, um, gosh, close to a year ago today or so, yeah, um, was really thoughtful design. We know this project is going to be a stress on the neighborhood, uh, particularly those that live right across the street or, or around the corner from the park. And so we really uh, approach this with thoughtful design in mind. Um, these are just some of the things that we've considered along the way. Um, we really have been cognizant of the use, of the heavy use of the soccer field and what can we do to try and minimize the interruption and outage of that facility. And so, as Rich mentioned, timing, when we start this project, and really thinking about um, you know, how long is the, the tank construction going to take, when are we gonna be able to start the park uh, restoration, um, how do the seasons allow us to um, squeeze in uh, the contractors to get work done before the heavy snow hits or it's too hot and the growing season's very poor for the, um, the new plantings. And we've had um, professional construction cost estimators and schedulers 
involved all along the way. And these are um, professional contractors. They really have taken a hard look at the documents that we've prepared and they've provided very detailed estimates of when the project um, is going to occur, how long each phase is going to take. And that information is important because it allows us to communicate to you all along the way realistic timeframes of when things are going to happen, when you're going to see excavation occurring, mass excavation for the tank, when you're going to see work in the roadways that might uh, require a detour, those kinds of things. Um, we've also uh, selected a method of constructing the tank that we think is very, um, not very invasive. Um, we're not going to be hammering piles down into the ground. Um, we're using a secant pile method of construction. Um, there's photographs um, of that, and if you watch the, the presentation that's on the Nunziato Project website from last time, you'll hear a description about that, and I'm happy to explain that again for anybody who wants to come and talk after the meeting. Um, and then how we stage vehicles and equipment. So this photograph generally shows once we've cleared the site what you might expect to see, the types of equipment that'll be out there um, for the first six months, just as they're drilling these secant piles. It's not gonna be a lot of loud, heavy machinery occupying the full site. Um, it'll be very busy, but you'll see generally this type of footprint. Um, there, uh, as I mentioned, also a controlled and predictable sequence of construction. So. Our schedule is such that you have to build one thing before you can build the next thing. And so we will be able to, to um, communicate w when things are being built. Um, these are a series of slides that show the controls and protective measures that are being uh, included in the project. They're a requirement of the construction contractor. Um, and there's some photographs here of the types of things that we're um, including in, in the project. Uh, the number one is dust control. So with all the earth that's going to be excavated from the field, um, there's an opportunity for a lot of that earth to, to end up on the roads and um, impacting um, you know, your quality of life. And so we've got uh, a first step, they'll be erecting sediment and erosion control barriers all around the park to contain that material if it rains and doesn't run off into the street. Um, street sweeping, suppressant sprays, and also uh, truck washing. So vehicles entering the site when they leave the site, there'll be a requirement for them to wash down the trucks so they're not tracking out the material um, on site. We have um, a series of controls uh, to maintain uh, noise and just the general overall appearance of the site. So the city nor noise ordinance will be in effect for this project, which is Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, the park will have a fence erected all around it. There's a privacy screen that will be incorporated into that. So it'll um, provide a visual buffer from all the activity in site, on the site. And there's requirements that the contractor um, go through regular clean, cleanup processes to make sure that all of the construction materials and debris that might be generated is kept in an orderly fashion and it's not strewn all over the site. And then they're also doing work out on the street. So um, they're not gonna be leaving stockpiles of materials for a long period of time that um, might impact your use of the, of the street. Uh, we have a variety of public health measures that'll be incorporated. Um, so in addition to security fencing is to keep people out of the field that might get injured if they were to enter it. Um, rodent controls, there was a concern the last meeting about just general um, waste management on the site. So we have added a requirement for special handling of food wastes um, trying to keep those organic wastes in a lock container where rodents can't get to that, um, so that we have less reliance on bait traps, which you see in this photograph, or um, other types of chemicals um, to prevent rodents. Uh, we also have a requirement for um, the mass DEP uh, diesel retrofit to occur. So all of the construction vehicles will be required to be retrofitted with de uh, diesel uh, arresters to um, reduce the um, pollution from those vehicles. Um, property is another concern that was raised, so older structures that might be sensitive to vibrations um, work nearby. And so we have incorporated uh, a requirement for uh, the contractor conduct a pre-construction survey. They'll be um, installing uh, settlement markers on building foundations. They'll be noting any um, existing conditions of poor um, uh, construction deterioration, cracks, those kinds of things. They'll also, you also have an opportunity for those properties that are immediately adjacent to the field to have your interior of your um, property inspected and documented and photographed. And so if there are any issues that come up over time, cracks that might appear, 
um, concerns that you have, if you feel that the construction has impacted your property, there will be a baseline for, for which us to review um, and to go back to the contractor um, if you want to file a damage claim. Um, and then we have real-time monitoring and adaptive response. So uh, we have, we'll be deploying seismographs, and there are um, industry standard thresholds so that if your property is experiencing vibrations that exceed a certain amount, the co contractor will be asked to change their method of operation to bring those vibrations back to within those um, restric restrictions. Um, if settlement is observed, that's something that we would be able to note through daily surveys and then um, take corrective actions to prevent further settlement and start working with the property owner and whether that's a problem. Um, and then we'll also be monitoring groundwater uh, throughout the project. We are not lost that this is going to be putting a big waterproof tank in the middle of the ground and it has the potential to change groundwater patterns during construction and afterwards. And so we've engaged um, our top geotechnical experts to talk about what are the types of situations that could develop during construction and afterwards. And we've done a lot of geological and hydrologic studies to convince ourselves that we can handle this issue um, all throughout the project. And when, when it's finished and constructed, we won't have a demonstrable change in groundwater conditions that would affect your property. Uh, tree protection as well. We have um, a pretty aggressive program to maintain a lot of the trees on site at the park as well as to add trees to the park and on the surrounding sidewalks. Um, so for those trees that are there, we want to make sure that they're kept in good health. So we are going to be erecting fenced boxes around them inside the limits of the park. And then we're also doing um, in, along the sidewalks where there's a little less room for these types of large protective boxes. Um, we put strapping and netting around the trees, and that prevents um, accidental damage if something bumps into it. Um, from a traffic management perspective, we recognize that there is a bike lane on Summer, um, Summer Street, excuse me, um, and we also have a lot of pedestrians that'll be moving around the area. So our traffic management plan is something the contractor will be required to maintain and adapt to um, as they move around the neighborhood doing the project work. And so it's not just vehicles that we're concerned about, we're also concerned about pedestrians and cyclists. And so those, um, their use of the sidewalks and crosswalks will be maintained, as well as maintaining um, ADA access um, uh, if any pedestrian ramps are disturbed and those kinds of things. Um, and then throughout that process, we have uh, plans for an aggressive community fa construction phase outreach program. Um, as Luisa mentioned, we have a website that will be maintained and updated throughout the project. Um, we have the email mailing list. There will be a series of tr uh, traditional communications. So if your property is construction near your home and um, we need to do something that might impact your use of the driveway one day, we, you'll definitely know about that well in advance to, and that'll be coordinated. Um, you will also be, we also have planned to do some neighborhood events and gather people much like we are here today, but in other settings, uh, talk about the status of the project and provide updates through that forum. Um, the city is also committed to uh, having a uh, community relations coordinator, and that'll be someone that would be a liaison to you for the project throughout construction um, to answer your questions and help um, resolve any issues that might be raised. And then we have an on site resident engineer. Um, budgeted and that's another resource so it won't just be the construction contractor and periodic visits by the design team and the city um, staff that are working on the construction but the actual representative of the city um, will be on site throughout the time and they'll be helping to make sure that all the other strategies I just went through are being maintained and implemented um, and are successful. So with that um, I'd like to invite Kevin up and he'll share some updates on the park um, design that have been uh, finalized over the last uh, month or so. Thanks, Emerson. Uh, I'm Kevin Butel. I'm a landscape architect with Stantec, and I'm heading up the team that's working with the city on the redesign of the park that's uh, above the tank that we've been talking about tonight. So this is an aerial photograph of the park as it exists today. So there's the dog park the fields, and then uh, some leftover areas. There's a picnic table as the, um, this area slopes down from the fields. So that's the current situation, trees along the perimeter. And the proposed design really doesn't make any major changes to that. So we're still having the dog park over on the left on the plan um, on Putnam Street. Athletic field stays where it is. You can kind of see the form of the grass field 
mimics the tank that's underground. Um, and then we're making some improvements around the perimeter of the park. So I'm gonna go through and kind of quickly talk about all of the improvements that we're proposing to do at the park. Again, happy to talk with people um, after the presentation with any specific questions or answer questions um, after we're done here. So that's the, the design concept. Um, one of the things we were looking at is improving entrances and circulation within the park. Right now, Nunziato Park kind of exists in pieces. So people come and go to the dog park, they come and go to the athletic field, but those two spaces are pretty disconnected from one another. So what we're trying to do is really improve the entrances at Putnam and Summer Street in the, on the left side and then the lower right at Putnam and Vinyl Avenue to make the entrances into the park more inviting and also make it more accessible to people. The natural grass field is gonna be a big upgrade from what's there now. It's gonna be a high performance field, so we're gonna bring in specialty growing media. It's a sand-based system, so water can drain through that system very quickly. One of the main reasons that fields you know, experience damage is when they get played on, when they're wet. So by going with this high performance system, the field will dry out much more quickly after a rainstorm, um, and then it'll be irrigated as well. So it should be a major upgrade from what's out there today. We're also going to be adding lighting. There's some lighting of the field right now, but it's really not very good lighting. So this is going to be much better lighting for the field. And this is a highly engineered, now, you know, I apologize. We're not building a full scale, you know, World Cup soccer field. Okay, but what we are using is the same technology that those fields have for lighting. So this light, as I think you can see from the picture here, we're lighting the field. We're not lighting the sidewalk next to the park. We're not lighting the street. We're not lighting the adjacent properties. This light is being direct, directed onto the field and the fixtures are engineered to specifically cut off that light so it's not spilling right outside of the park. What's that? Right into my bedroom. <laughs> well, they're designed specifically not to do that. So the light does not go that I'll way. Green infrastructure, something that we talked about. So we've got a lot going on in this park underneath the ground. We're also trying to do as much as we can to manage stormwater responsibly at the surface. So there are a couple of locations along Vinyl Avenue where we're pulling water off of the street, bringing it into the park, running it through the park, through the landscape areas. So we're trying to use that water as a resource. So to clean the water, but then also make that water available to the plants in the perennial gardens and the trees that we're planting in the park. We're also excited about this terrace rain garden we're having at uh, one of the entrances to the park. So this is kind of a quick computer sketch of what that would look like. The water that we're bringing in is eventually gonna work its way to this system where it can step down in these landscape terraces. And so these are designed to be ornamental stormwater gardens and we've got pathways that cut through those so people will be able to interact and see that uh, up close. We're also designing spaces for people. So we wanted to make sure for some of these areas immediately adjacent to the field um, and other areas within the park that we have com comfortable places for people to come to the park. So even if you're not there to walk your dog, if you're not there to play sports or watch your children compete in athletic events, there will still be places for people to come and have kind of a nice respite um, here at Nunziato. For trees, we've really tried to do as much as we possibly can to preserve all the trees we possibly can on site. And when, where we can't, um, we're making sure that we're replacing any trees that we take out at greater than a two to one. So if I remember correctly, I think there are seven trees that we're proposing to remove. Three of those seven are either dead, mostly dead, or are in seriously poor health. Um, and we're putting back, I think it's 17 or 18 trees. So seven coming out, 18 going in. So there's a, a, net, um, a, a net increase, a substantial increase in the amount of trees in the site. And then again, we're also pulling water and managing water in a way so they feed into those landscape areas. So hopefully those trees will turn into lush, healthy trees over time. And so this is showing where we've got the yellow or existing trees that are gonna remain and the darker colors um, are proposed trees. 
For the dog park, this is one thing that has been updated since the last time we presented the park design. So we showed a few different concepts for what we could do for the dog park. We received comments on that. One of the comments we received was tried to give the dog park as much space as possible. So we reconfigured this pedestrian pathway here, shifted it down to give more space to the dog park. And one of the things that we're looking at here, so we're going to have a granular base material in the dog park, and then we're going to have these features within the dog park that will be multi-purpose. So we're going to have these kind of shallow mounds that rise up out of the surface that will give something for the dogs to run, in, run on, run around. But they'll be low, so this isn't going, to, isn't going to create any kind of significant visual barrier. At the entrances, we've got the trash receptacles. We're looking at doing a customized trash receptacle with a lid that will close and manage odors. On the side, we're going to have a small seating area because another thing that we heard in the last meeting was that this is a dog park and to make as much space for the dogs as possible. Um, we're also having these stone features scattered through the park, so that's another feature for dogs to run around, run on, and the stones that are along the edge of the park could also be used as informal seating for people if there are a lot of people in the dog park. And so this is just sort of generally the character that we're talking about. So a granular base and then these you know, somewhat rustic rectilinear stones that are placed within the dog park. Come back here. I want to thank you for your patience. That was very long and very technical, but we all thought it was very important to kind of step back and give an understanding of why we're doing this, that it is a comprehensive and systematic solution to the water problems that we're having, which are getting more intense. If you know anything about climate change, it's one of the things, and, and all cities are struggling with this. It's not uh, only Somerville, but you know what we really wanted to get across is that this works as a system. We have very few opportunities to make it better, and we're trying, and Nunziata was one of those. And then, uh, of course, you're sitting there saying, well, it's in my backyard. We wanted to talk about the construction and then let you know about the park. So at this point, I want to open it up to questions that you have. And again, I thank you for your patience. I know it's hard to sit through all of that, uh, but we will take questions and the whole team will be here to answer them. Uh, and then you know, we're free to, we will stay here until all of your questions are answered. I do want to, before we start that, make sure that I reiterate again, if you can print your name clearly, I can put you on the email list. That's one way to communicate. Everything is on the website, including all the past three presentations. This presentation will also be on the website uh, and with a link to a YouTube video. Uh, so certainly for your neighbors and friends, if they want to learn about stormwater in Somerville, now you have that all uh, documented, but also to get updates on this specific project. So with that, I'm going to ask um, for questions. OK, let's start over here. You said on Thursday there's going to be a Somerville Avenue Somerville. I think what Rich said was that the Board of Aldermen was going to start well, discussing are, that. Is the public invited to that? Yeah, as, as with all um, uh, Aldermen meeting, it is a public meeting. But yeah, it's okay. it's uh, the intent of it is to uh, initiate orientation. If you found my uh, presentation tonight boring, um, I did not. I did not. I did not. It, it, it will be twice as long and twice as boring. But <laughs> no, that's fine. Do you know what time it is? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. And the location of that is. City Hall. Okay. Right over here. Right? City, Hall. City Hall. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Briscoe. I live on Preston Road with my husband, my daughter, and a dog, and we take multiple trips to and on the street to ground and on down the field um, every day. So um, really excited to have this opportunity to learn more about the project and really share my comments. So I've got two primary comments. Um, one is uh, with regard to what um, accommodations are we make for people who are currently using that park every day during that three to four year period when that park won't be available for us. And also I've got some specific questions about um, the design of the park, uh, the entrances, um, and, uh, and, and another related thing with the dog park. So starting with accommodations, um, 
Yeah, obviously there are people who are using the park every day of our lives, multiple times a day. Um, but it's our community park. We walk to that park. We bring our dogs to that park multiple times a day. Um, I just hope that the city is going to be proactive and think about creating accommodations for current users. Because if the city is not proactive, the city is going to find itself having to be reactive because users will make their own accommodations. So that's my first comment. With regard to the design of the park, I'd like to actually get a little bit more detail on um, the entrances and this idea of combined entrances. I'd like to point out that separate entrances are currently a feature of the park. Um, I know that uh, there could be better circulation and that would be great, but um, with the dog park, we currently have what we call an airlock system. Imagine you're familiar with that. The idea is you open the gate, you bring your dog in, you take your dog off leash, gate closed behind you. You open the next gate, your dog goes in, you close that gate, the airlock is still secure. You have not brought a leashed dog into the dog park. There's no way that any of the unleashed dogs can get out. People who aren't coming in and out of the park with dogs don't think about this. They're thinking, oh my god, that event's already started. I've got to get there really quickly. A lot of concern about gates left open among one particular set of users, and less concern with this fine among other users who don't have that um, that issue. So I would just like to make sure that the airlocks are going to stay. So th those we place. we have that was something we heard during the um, the past meetings, and that is something that is happening in the dog park specifically. Um, Kevin, feel free to jump in, but you know we have uh, the the entrances are still separated, they just work in a different way. In other words, there's still an entrance into the field. The field is still surrounded by fencing for obvious reasons. There's still a separate entrance into the dog park. Those are separated. Uh, but you don't have to walk all the way up vinyl to get there. There's more of a centralized seating area with pathways that make sense, that meet ADA and AAB for uh, grades for wheelchairs and that have entrances. So yeah, there's still two ways in and out of the dog park because that was another big thing. You don't want to get stuck in the dog park and not be able to get out without going through whatever capacity. So there is the, are you referring to the gate, the different gates that there's, go in? There are two airlocks right now. Yes. And so there are two ways in. If you come in here, someone comes in behind you. Yeah, so currently we just have one airlock entrance shown to the dog park. We have another maintenance access entrance so that was something i didn't talk about but specifically your question i think currently we're only showing one airlock the but there's nothing the about the layout that we're showing where we couldn't add a second so yeah. that's certainly something that would be an, an easy change to make. i would recommend that i was involved in the planning of the initial layout of the dog park and that was something we took very seriously and the last comment i wanted to make on the dog park is i didn't hear anything about a water feature a, a you know fountain that provides water for humans and for dogs right. and maybe a paw wash there's a paw wash at the zero new washington street dog park that that's my fault i removed that slide but there is indeed uh there are drinking fountains in two locations as well as a doggy drinking fountain <coughs> and the paw wash is not something that we're showing now but that's something we could take a look at it and like the entrances that would be something that would be easy to, to have. Thanks for giving me so much time, and I've uh, had my say, so I'll be quiet. Thank you. Yes, uh, back. Hi, my name is Jacob. I live on Quincy Street. Um, and I really appreciated the introduction to this whole thing about the historical context that we're working with and why we had this problem in Somerville. Um, and what I, there's two things that I would like to see. The first is that um, I'd like to see sort of a different solution to this problem. I know a lot of work has gone into this, but like when I look at, say, the alewife um, area, you've got a constructed wetland that is dealing with um, combined sewage overflow problems. Um, and that is an amenity for the people around there, and it solves a lot of problems at once. You've got wastewater um, being dealt with, and you have a park, essentially. Um, and I think that's sort of what Somerville is missing because we built over our river. Um, and so when I see this, I see something that is having a lot of like public input, like we're coming to these meetings, but it's being presented as 
like a fait accompli. Um, and we're not really being asked, like, how do we want to deal with our water? Because, I mean, that water is a resource. Um, and it could be growing lots of plants, we could have birds, we could have um, ponds, and instead we're going to just put it in a Tupperware, and then we're going to pump it out to Deer Island, and we're going to pay for that. And I just, I don't think we're, like, culturally, like, at that point anymore. Like, that's not what people want. Um, we want to see something creative, we want to see something that's sustainable, and we want to see something that, you know, makes us proud as a city. Well said, and I agree with you. Um, um, so I, I would also point out that you referenced the, the alewife um, wetland, which was a Cambridge project. Um, and we are now adopting a Cambridge methodology in how we're managing stormwater. In addition to the uh, wetland, Cambridge is employing a number of tanks like this um, throughout uh, the city of Cambridge. They are continuing to do so. They have not shifted away from the tank concept because they have adopted a stormwater um, wetland concept. These things have to be done together. Um, we do not have the opportunity to manage all of our stormwater with the wetland, nor does Cambridge. Um, they had an opportunity with the CAM4 sewer separation uh, and a number of other um, projects to feed stormwater to that wetland. I would submit to you that we are on a path to be able to do that. Um, with this combination of projects, including the Somerville Ave drain and the GLX connection, um, we are marching towards that sort of uh, putting in the upstream infrastructure that then would facilitate downstream infrastructure like the stormwater wetland. Um, it's also important to know that Nutziato works in concert with the GLX connection such that the timing of the discharge from, uh, the, um, from the tank works with that connection. So we're not discharging back to the MWRA system, we're discharging to the MBTA system. So ultimately that stormwater goes to the Charles River and not to Deer Island. Um, it's, it's all part of a strategy. We, we don't have the, the land area um, or other infrastructure to entirely embrace one solution. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we're marching towards um, greener solutions. And there are, there are green aspects to the Somerville Ave drain um, design as well that, um, frankly, I think are now in advance of what Cambridge has done um, recently on Huron Ave uh, and elsewhere. Um, so I, your, your point is, is excellent. There are a number of things that we need to do, um, but that's not to the exclusion of the other things that we have to do. I'm going to turn it off my <laughs> A uh, couple of things. If we're going to keep talking about Cambridge and their storage tanks, we can mention that they just shelved the plan to use a park as a storage tank, and they primarily use parking lots because they know about the disruptions associated with using parks as storage tanks. Um, also, uh, when it comes to the 10-year level of increase that we're looking forward to, um, how much of that 10-year level is based, that you, you mentioned that before, do you remember what I'm talking about now? So how much of that 10-year increase that we are trying to catch up with is based on Boynton Yards development and Union Square development, which is where the river that we were just clapping about could be possibly put instead of the increased development that will simply turn into more usage as opposed to more control. Great. So um, as it, when, when we're evaluating alternatives and doing things like, like sizing this tank and, and how we operate it um, and we run the model, we're, we're really targeting the 10-year design storm to make our, our decisions, our design decisions on, on how we build it and how we operate it. Um, that's largely based on our, our existing loads and our existing conditions. 
the development in Union Square and Boynton Yards and elsewhere does not exempt from the four to one offset that I mentioned earlier. So as, as that development happens, uh, any increase in sanitary load to our system, um, those developers are expected to pay into the fund that then finds other projects to remove stormwater. Also, at the same time, their development plans um, are also reviewed by the engineering office to make sure that they're not uh, increasing their stormwater contributions uh, to the system. So the net effect of the development will be to remove water from the system. Ah, you really look perplexed. That does make sense. But, yeah. <laughs> that, that means, like, right now, if you look at what we currently have in that area, if you go from the Lanco staging all the way back to... Sure, if you go back to Lanco staging for the backside of Target over in the Boynton Yards area, the tracks that are currently there, that I find it incredibly hard to believe that there's going to be a decreased amount of water usage or water that needs to be put someplace else. Correct compared to a bunch of crappy, dilapidated parking lots and open space. Agreed. Um, and it becomes an engineering challenge for the developers to develop their site, incorporating things like green stormwater infrastructure and stormwater detention and stormwater infiltration on their site as part of their development. I mean, you, you are talking about some very large scale things happening for Boynton Yards and, and uh, um, Union Square, but these are the same things that they are doing in Assembly Square, where there is large-scale development. There, um, each one of those buildings has to be designed for, for a zero net increase uh, in rate of runoff and runoff volume uh, for um, the, the design storms. And their sanitary contributions have to be offset um, by other projects that remove stormwater from our system. I, I, I understand that it, it strains credibility, but um, it is one, one of the challenges that, uh, that um, we put on developers as they, they come in and do their development, and our, our engineering staff uh, is, is tasked with reviewing those plans um, to make sure that they're not fudging the calculations or, or making errors, um, that, that there are net reductions. And, and it often um, puts us in, in difficult situations for smaller developments um, particularly um, that, that are, are, you know, have, have a, a challenge of what to do with their stormwater and they want to connect into, into the system. And by city ordinance, we have to say no. They can't connect stormwater into the system. I think it's also important, if I can just jump in, to say that um, even if there were no development, we still have to do this. Yeah. We're still at a situation where we have water problems. We do have water problems, but I, why do we need to do this? If you look at the map of where the flooding is currently taking place, the overwhelming majority of the flooding that is taking place currently is taking place in undeveloped areas. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if they are developed, you have, if you look at the bottom of Summer Lab right now, you have a giant flat gravel pit, which will be there for the next three years. That before that was a giant heavy metal dump. It is not an area where a lot of people have lived or do or live currently. and or are currently yeah. using it. Yeah. It's just modern and nobody can hear you. I and you spent the last 10 minutes. It's it's he's, he, doesn't, he didn't realize that he, you couldn't hear him. He will speak a little louder. I'll try to speak louder. Right now, the areas where they are looking at developing are currently allowing water to soak into the ground, except for the areas where you have that nice heavy metal soupy thing going on in the middle of what used to be the Atlantis metal yard, mm -hmm. right? Everybody knows that big yeah. nasty puddle of whatever that is. Um, the, the, the idea that the flooding that is currently taking place needs to be resolved by putting a tank in the ground compared to putting in larger catch basins and just simply moving the water that's on Summer Bowl, Summer Lab, and Summer Street further down the system and putting it into the areas where nobody currently is doesn't seem like a bad one to me. There is isn't something there now. And what we're dealing with is, and this is, are you going to? 
show me a picture of, well, no, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm my So as we're making the, the design decisions from, um, from the model, we're not looking at those areas that you're, you're describing. We're looking at uh, Somerville Ave, um, you know, places like the, the public safety building on Somerville Ave. Um, there's Prospect Street, um, Bennett uh, uh, Court uh, floods, um, areas of Newton uh, and uh, Emerson, all are areas that, those are the um, Allen Street, um, those are not the areas that you're talking about. These, these are areas that, that have residential homes that are currently developed, and those are the hot spots that we're reducing flooding um, at with this project. It's not further down. Th those aren't the areas. You know, those areas <coughs> may be subject to flooding, but that's not in our um, area of analysis for the benefits. I, why not? Because he, this gentleman right here is correct. If, the, if, the, if this is the problem area, why are you? I, I live at the bottom of, of Putnam and Summer and Summer Street. There's no flooding. I have to tell you, um, there is flooding over where you want to do that. I don't understand why that's not an option. That, op that option does not affect residents. It doesn't affect property value. It doesn't affect. If they're, if they're going to do the turnaround for the green line, about it right there. If, if you look at it again, if, if they're going to do a, if they're going to do a turnaround for the green line, just dig it up now, get it over with, and then lay the tracks on top, and it's all done, and everything's done, and you don't, and Somerville and Union Square is not totally effed up for the next ten years. Right. We have we have worked so hard. I lived here for fifteen years. We worked so hard for for gentrifying Union Square. And to have this screwed up for five years over here and five years over there is just, a, it's a travesty. It is an absolute travesty. And the high school. And so the what, high school. Is, what, is, what is the alternative to... Like, Across the street from the Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> Dig it up. That it's already right there. Put the target parking lot. Lay the tracks over it, and it's done. You have everybody acclimated, acclimated to the traffic. It's going to be fine. You're going to screw up traffic on two ends of Union Square for literally ten years. You're going to have businesses collapse. You're going to. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. This is not a solution. It's incredibly this is a invasive. Problem. It's very invasive, and there are other very things like invasive. last meeting you were talking about the target parking lot, and that that actually was yep. a viable option. That is a viable. And that we just didn't pursue it for because some of other cost. reasons because of cost. It's cost. It wasn't cost effective, right? Because that's not owned by the city of Somerville. But the truth of the matter is, is that there is there isn't the same kind of impact. If if you're doing Thank that you. over there. And it seems to be closer to the areas that you were just talking about to alleviate the flooding. Mm -hmm. so it, and if you're only want. talking about a 10-year no level the of service, we're talking about a 10-year level of service for a minimum five of five of years of construction? <laughs> that seems ridiculous. Well, like, absolutely ridiculous. Is, right? I mean, if you say, if you've looked at Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park has been under construction for how many years now? And that's also been <laughs> the third project the that they tried to do uh, in Lincoln, Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park, what's the budget now versus the original? <laughs> and is that <laughs> being considered? <laughs> I'm just looking for an example. That's a comparison. That's that's a comparison. That's that's was, 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 by, was that put into the new No. 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 How does the increase time? We have, I mean, come on, guys. We have to kind of focus on what we're trying to focus on. What we are trying to focus on is the fact that there are a lot of people that are not happy with the fact that the city has decided that they are going to do something to us as opposed to with us. And once that happens, you end up with a group of people that are going to voice their concerns about the fact that they don't like the plan. It's not that I care about, I have a dog. I, I want a better dog park. Great, let's do it. How much does that cost? It's not $13 million before it gets bonded out. Plus, how much do the pumps cost? Who pays to run the pumps? What's the actual cost of having this put in? 
It's not $13 million, because once you push it out on what, a 30-year bond? How long is the bond? Does anybody yeah, know what the, the city is bonding it out at? Yeah, how much yeah, we have yet with the appropriation. Okay, but if you look at an average yeah, city bond, that's the million, and they can address that. I think that's what it is. But what are we expecting the cost of the project to be once it actually gets bonded out? We don't have those numbers from the finance department. I'd be happy to get them for the group. It ultimately depends on when they bond for them, when the board approves it, uh, when the board bonds for it, and what the rates are at that time. So, do we know, just a couple of quick questions about finance. Do we know how much this actually costs today? How much the work that has been done today, yeah, or how much this the, estimate the, is? The slide shows the amount of work that we've paid for today. So the slideshow has been largely... Slideshow of staff time. <laughs> Reused. I'd be happy to calculate that for you. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, we can get... You said that you chose none of the other part because that was the most efficient. It was budget efficient. What, what was the budget that you used for that? Yeah. I believe at the second meeting you said it was $25 million. Is that correct? 13. No. 13? Oh, it was 13? Mm -hmm. Okay. That, at that meeting, they also planned it for two years less, so I'm not sure how that changes. Exactly, 26 months, yeah. now it's four years. Can we get so. a cost per month of just having a construction site? And then also a cost of the bond, and then also a cost Fair of right. actually running the pumps. Mm -hmm. Every maintenance kind of for runs. the pumps and maintenance. Yeah. What's the actual expected life <laughs> of the system? Because you just, in our historical, and I apologize if I'm a little fired up, but you're talking about drive, like literally altering my entire home life. For five, five years. years. So it's it's a bit of a concern. Again, I apologize if A, I'm mumbling, and B, well, we, I'm acting we a little. absolutely understand that. Nobody is saying that it's not a real concern, that it's not going to affect your life. We absolutely understand it. No, but what what, what we, we are now, also it's saying is really it's going clear. to happen. It's, it's and, happening. And this meeting is about what the construction impacts are going to be. That's how you presented this. Also, when, when you say that you flyered, who did you fly or when did you fly her? Yes, yeah, started because it was, when? Was it after the third meeting? That was the only time we got a flyer after we so asked I people to fly her. First and second meeting. Two said, houses? All around, every house that a bus. How many people got first. a flyer in their mailbox? For the first, for for the first, first or second meeting. For the first or second meeting. Anyone? How many people got one? Zero. It, so it's, it's hard. I mean, everybody has a mailbox here, and, and nobody got a notice. We can't put the flyers in the mailbox. The other thing that frequently I, happens... So what, what's the city's policy for any kind of zoning or any other construction that's being done on a private residence? And if, if I want to put a dormer on my house, what am I required to do? Mm -hmm. As city officials, does anybody know that? Mm -hmm. yeah. you have to contact your, your brothers and neighbors in that. Um, on yeah, that I train. live 15 feet across from a five-year project where you're planning on digging 30 feet no, straight no, down to bedrock, no, mile, drilling so two walls. It's mind. a ridiculous amount mind. of work. <clears throat> on top of that, you're literally talking about impacting every single person's house yeah. by disrupting all of the storm drains, everybody's driveways. You're removing half the parking on Vinyl Ave. Not to talk about the people that just use the dog park that aren't abutters. Not to talk about the people that use the field for soccer. And you didn't even mail letters. And what's it might be illegal to it's put a flyer in a mailbox, but it is certainly not mail. legal to mail a letter. <laughs> and the fact that you guys... I'm sorry? They can put it on your door. Yeah, yeah, they can yeah exactly. Door and that is yep. exactly what we do. Nobody but nobody here got one. A notice. I live on the corner. I didn't get so I have to go and that's, that's for direct abutters. That's, I'm not even talking about people that live on Wesley Park who also didn't get it, people that live on Aldersey that didn't receive any that's information right. about this. That's there right. are multiple people that don't have computers. And according to your system, essentially, you need to show up to a meeting to get on an email list to find out about meetings. Or you need to see the city website, or you need to follow Why do I need to be proactive to find out that you are about to completely disrupt here. my life? I've paid taxes here for 25 okay. years. So so your salary, how is that back? not... Because there's, I understand that there's a lot of concern and passion. We all get that. But what we were trying to do is to explain that we have a systematic and citywide problem. And this is something that happens everywhere, whether it's one controversy or another, where we're trying to solve a system. We are trying to make a system-wide, citywide problem better. And what we have is localized opposition 
And this happens in many of the things that we are dealing with, whether it's in parks, whether it's in infrastructure. So we try to step back and explain the why of why we are doing this. The why is showing us that you need to deal with a certain amount of water downstream from exactly. this issue where there is a significantly lower amount of people that live downstream currently. And what you're talking about doing is building up capacity in a stormwater system so that you can increase the use of the system downstream. That's what that slide says, right? Absolutely not. That is the exact antithesis of what that slide says. So when you put in your storage tank halfway down at Bow Street on that sign, what are you actually trying to do? Because can I explain what I think you're trying to do and sure. then you can tell me if you're wrong? At the Bow Street intersection, basically what you're trying to do is capture the water that's coming downhill from Somerville Ave so that you can allow the water that's in the tank, or not the tank, in the, the, the sewer system already, to actually leave through the MWRA pipes. So essentially, you're trying to open up room in the pipes so that you can have the water actually escape prior to then pumping the rest of the water that's coming down from Davis Square into the system and allow it to go out again. So the only water that you're really dealing with is the water that is already down from the Nunziato Park. That's the reason why you're storing water at Nunziato, is so that you can move more water that's further down the system. So, not exactly. Close? For like a carpenter? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I go back to the bathtub analogy. <laughs> Why don't we go back to a pipe analogy where you basically, you're simply trying to increase the amount of capacity that you have for the water that is below the rest of the system. You're trying Not to change the timing too though, right? Okay. It's all that. When, when it rains, all the water comes at once. If it's in the tank, then it comes over days. I guess I haven't been at previous meetings, but it was brought up that the target parking lot or somewhere near there is the a feelers, yeah. other possibility. Why has that been fully ruled out? Or can it, it that be looked at again? As a matter of fact, and um, the, the the target parking lot um, is, is actually a, a location not too far from there. Uh, is where the infrastructure to connect to the GLX system uh, is planned. And as part of that uh, is a storage tank along with it. Um, basically, it, it's a, it's a two-tank system um, to connect into the, MW, uh, the MBTA system. Um, so there is a tank at that location as well. Um, so this is, again, none of these things are to the exclusion <coughs> of the others. Um, the concept is to do as much as we possibly can. Um, the way that that tank would operate uh, and the, the benefits from it in terms of flood reduction uh, right at the heart of Union Square is different from the benefits at this location, um, simply because of the elevation uh, and the proximity. The lower, when you put the tank at the lower area, you can't control when that tank fills. Um, and it fills up too early in the system, uh, too early during the storm. Um, by the time everything is all backing up and coming out of the ground at our flood areas, that tank is already filled up and is not providing any benefit. The way we can operate at Nuziato uh, is because we are at that upstream location and we can control the filling of that tank once we know we're already at our flood stage, once our pipes are already filled. Um, it, it, it has to do with uh, opportunity and effectiveness. Um, it, uh, being upstream of the flooding gives us more opportunity to, to, to control the flow rather than being downstream. Uh, when you know you can be active as opposed to reactive, it, it's, um, it's it's the way the system works and and how we can operate our 150-year-old system with some new additions. 
uh, to maximize the benefit. Can, can you actually be more quantitative in that description when you say that Nunziata would be more effective? Does that mean if we put it in Nunziata, that saves us from a 100-year flood, whereas Target only saves us from a 10-year flood? I mean, which level of disaster so, does each so the, attack? The, the modeling shows that the 1.6 million gallon tank at Nunziata allows us to eliminate 1.1 million gallons of surface water flooding in Union Square. Um, moving the Is tank. That um, we have 12 floods in 50 years, which doesn't seem extreme. I know that for the people affected, it is extreme, but I mean, that's of those 12 floods, how many would the Nunziato have prevented? That's something that's tangible to me as a non engineer. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's 1.3 million gallons during the 10 year storm. So that's 1.3 million gallons of less surface water flooding. Um, that occurs. So does the model show how deep the puddle gets? I suppose there, you could zoom in on that um, level of resolution. Um, you tend to I mean, you said it's, it's all about the pieces coming yeah, together. So about, with the pieces that are in place now, plus this, minus this, right. if you yeah, were to you replace can, that with target, what's, that's how, how deep is the puddle with target? How deep is the puddle with Nunziata? for the 12 floods that happened in the last 50 years. That, to me, would seem like a really tangible way to explain to me that Nunziato is the better option. We can work on, um, on developing that specific answer. We've got, we've got modeling results and, and flood maps that illustrate sort of around that point. Um, we can put it in that context to determine what, what that means, what that looks like. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, a few questions. Um, one is about process and the city's process, and I, I feel like um, I encountered this at Lincoln Park, which when we were called to a meeting and the city presented to us why they were putting in an artificial turf field. And it was never a question of if. And I don't know if you guys know the results of that battle, but the results of that was that we did get a grass field. and so. And secondly, I'm appalled that the neighbors and abutters were not made aware. I mean, for the West Branch Library renovation, there was like, I don't know, 100 people, like all those neighbors got that information. So that is, I, I'm shocked and I don't know if there's been any, if not doing that has been against the law in some way, in some sort of legal, I feel like, like they, they're yeah. trying to sneak this out. I, 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 I feel that way too, and and so, I mean, my questions before this was brought up were rather gentle, but I'm going to address this topic now. So, in terms of why we're doing it, do we not consider, for example, doing green infrastructure like all along Summer Street? Have we considered, I know we're thinking in the future of doing permeable pavers, but every single year we do redo the sidewalks and you know, a permeable paver can be holes drilled into the sidewalk. Like it, can, it does not need to be super fancy. So all I'm saying is that I think it could be less expensive just to go along the street and up the street and, and just push for stormwater capture as it goes down. Permeable pavers all along Summer Street, yeah. is that going to cost, you know, what's that cost versus doing what is being proposed to, to be done? Again, not a question of, hmm, do we think this is the right thing to do, but here's why we're doing it. And, and that is what rubs me the wrong way because of the experience with Lincoln Park. And mm -hmm. I, I have a lot more questions, but I'm going to let these guys hold the floor no. for a while, so. Keep going, you're doing great. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's it for now. <laughs> Are you basically doing Nunziato because Nunziato is there yeah. for you to use? I mean, even in you, when you were speaking at first, you said that. It's there for you to use. And that's why it's going in there. Well, it, it presents an excellent opportunity. Yeah, it's there where, where, for you to use. Whereas there aren't opportunities elsewhere. But Nunziato is there, and that's why you're doing it. It's, it's one way of phrasing it. <laughs> but it's, it, it's really the, the fact that 
there is an opportunity to do a project like this there. There is not an opportunity to, to do an impactful, cost-effective project like this elsewhere. And, and, you know, it was an exhaustive look at 60% of the areas, uh, at the city's land mass, to determine what could be done um, and what would have an impact and what would have a beneficial impact cost effectively. Um, and whilst green infrastructure um, is part of the tableau, it does not present the volume of benefit or the cost effectiveness that this project does. Which is again, not to say that we aren't pursuing it. We're incorporating it into all the park designs. We're incorporating it into the Somerville Ave drain extension. We will be incorporating it elsewhere where we're doing public improvements. Um, but it doesn't get us to our goals of getting stormwater out of the system when we need it that has benefit in Union Square. This has not been a hidden project. We have tried very hard to get the word out. Um, and this is not something that is a, um, a pet project of anyone up here. You could vote it down. That's one less thing I have to worry about for the next five years of construction. Um, but ultimately, we are sacrificing the summer vision goals and the city vision of removing stormwater from the system. Again, it comes back to the fact that after a lot of engineering study and hydraulic modeling and cost estimation and looking at this from several different views, this is a very effective project. As is the lab drain, as is the GLX connection. All of these are important things that need to be knitted together to achieve the goals. Um, I think it would have been much more effective and when I go for walks, it pains me to see the amount of, of driveways that are paved over, and which, again, there is a requirement for landscaping, so those are, somehow they got passed the design review, and someone said it was okay for them to fill their, you know, cover their yards in, in pavement. And so we see that. So, so that's a point where a problem wasn't caught early on, like something, somebody did wrong. But what kills me is so all of the drain pipes go, you know, into the driveways, into the street. Could we not have, you know, first of all, depaving, number one, um, not allowed people to put the water collected, you know, collectively from all their roofs into into the street. Again, I I, I just I really feel that that if we saw this like. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that water isn't getting into the ground all, all in Somerville. So if we were able to get to that water before, we, would we have this problem? And, and, and I, I know that, that in the future, in the future, we're going to have the permeable, permeable pavers. In the future, we're going to have you know, yeah. proper structural cells and, and, and tree pits that capture the storm water. Like, I, I just wonder if, if if there had been any investigation in, in that type of, of, you know, of green infrastructure, would have that, would have that been another option on the table? Yes, it, and it is. Um, you, you are right that there are a number of um, design decisions that have been made over the past 150 years in what has been built. And we are slowly um, becoming more progressive uh, and what the city evaluates and permits um, and allows. You know, a lot of a lot of the things that you mentioned are now illegal, um, and, and uh, I would be widely unpopular with a much larger population than you if I pursued everyone, every every private citizen. I'm sure that there are are people here um, who have illicit connections to to the system, um, and when they are discovered. We have them disconnected. Uh, I, I, I can fight this man. I, I take notes when I go for my walks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, um, I'm serious. Sub pumps. I think you're talking about just. I'm talking some about roof discharge. discharge is the same. It's true. It's 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 sump pumps. It's roof discharge. It is driveway runoff. Um, 
these are the way things were done um, from 1840 until 2000 or so. Um, we are slowly writing the ship. These are not things that we allow to have happen now. Uh, and when um, redevelopment is uh, before us, whenever we have the teeth to do so, we eliminate it. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult to find and do it unless there is a reason for us to do it. If you put a dormer on your house, if you're expanding the square footage of your house, it gives us a reason to review your site plan. And it gives us an, an entry point to review what it is you're doing with stormwater. And it allows us to do that. But right now, that's, a, that's our entry point. And, and, and we, we are trying to right the wrongs of a long time. But it is a big city, and that's a slow process, one house at a time. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you, but I'll just put it out there as a general question. Uh, I live in the Davis Square area along the bike path, so I'm not an immediate abutter. But we looked at, at stuff near you and yes, found I it know. didn't we work. Have, we have flooding issues <laughs> we, on the we bike actually path. Looked at the that's tank a whole, behind yeah, I, what I used understand. to be the right aid, whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it didn't have any benefit? Yeah. <laughs> um, my comment is more from a, I, I'm a, a dog business owner, so I use Nunziato every day for my business. So. You all are my customers. Um, I'm a so, so I'm impacted in a very different way. But I have alternatives. And I, this is really a question that I think um, I'm asking on behalf of the abutters, who I have <coughs> tremendous empathy for. Um, it feels like the big chunk of all these conversations that has been missing is what I'll call the customer care aspect of this. There's, where is the conversation that says, we get that you're concerned about property values, about your ability or inability to sell your property for the next five years, given that there's a construction site in your front yard. Exactly. We get that you are worried about chemicals getting into the air, your small children, et cetera, et cetera, the whole gamut of things that people are concerned about. And here's what we've set up to address your concerns. If you want to sell your house, if you have to move, you have a job transfer, and you can't sell your home because of this, the city will buy back, will buy your house from you. If you can't, you know, if your home, if you want to do renovations to your home, but because we're in your way, that prevents you from doing necessary repairs or renovations, we will assist you in making that happen. None of the, what I haven't heard, is a way for anybody who's immediately impacted to feel any level of comfort that their quality of life concerns are being addressed, more than just saying, we hear you. That, if I lived there, that would not be enough for me. I would want to know that if I needed to get out of this situation, you guys would help me. You know, that's why, that's one of the reasons that you, you choose a city to live in, you pay taxes in a city, you don't expect to have things put on you. And if they're going to be, at least if someone says, we have remedies for you, don't worry. These are the remedies, this is the process. That, that is the piece for me that feels like it's really missing and I think mm -hmm. is causing maybe more upset than there would be. Sure. So, so, well, I, I have yeah, I mean, like, so, 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 I'm so, 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 for the next five years because I cannot do it. My girlfriend is in the medical profession. We're looking to move to California. This is no longer no longer an option for us because we're going to have to stay. I mean, that's I, I love this city. I absolutely love this city. I don't want to move to California. But I don't. I also don't want to lose $100,000 on a $485,000. So we, we, we have a number of questions already on the table. And I'd like to start to address at least some of them. Okay. Um, I recently alluded to it. Um, but, but in our uh, vigor to get through a lot of slides, um, perhaps we didn't dwell on it long enough. Um, 
What we are proposing as part of our construction phase services during this project, which the city hasn't done um, previously, um, is to have a um, community outreach professional as part of our project staff for this. Um, we also have a resident engineer. So they have sort of two different focuses and skill sets. The resident engineer uh, is tasked with making sure that the contractor conforms to all of the mitigation measures that Emerson mentioned. Mm -hmm. We have baked a lot of mitigation, minimization of impacts, minimizing dust, minimizing um, uh, uh, noise, vision, everything. The resident engineer, in addition to making sure the thing's built right um, and, and will last for 50 to 100 years, um, the resident engineer is on, on site full time to make sure that the, that the contractor is adhering to those components of the specifications that say, hey, look, you have to take the neighbors into consideration. That is a different skill set from a community outreach person. Mm -hmm. who serves as the point person for if you have a concern, if you see something that you don't like or you want addressed, um, you can go to that single point of contact and, and, and know that that person is going to facilitate a response for you, whether it be through contractor behaviors, um, something that we can um, modify that the contractor is doing, so, or something that the city can do in terms of, of how we manage the project or how we provide services. Um, this, this, this is how we're staffing construction management for it. It is with an, with an outward um, <coughs> focus to make sure that we minimize the, the, the impacts and hear the concerns throughout. I think in it's more about, uh, excuse me, but I think it's more about, um, I heard that and I think that's great. I think it's more about prospective management of communications. It's a public relations exercise. So that's, that's why I All that stuff should have been sent to the affected parties long in advance so that before people got all fired up about, oh my God, what about, what about, what about? The initial, you know, some sort of, and I don't know how the communications in this city works, but um, I know what lists I'm on and the things I get. Um, but to be, uh, to be in, I guess I would have appreciated, if I were one of those people, I would have appreciated eight months ago or when these conversations started and were, had congealed enough that you could communicate something out to say, I would have appreciated something that said, this is the plan, this is the general plan, we know it's going to have an impact on abutters, but these are the things we are already putting in place to address no, that. I, I and think not the, wait the until expectation of communications has shifted in the city. Um, these aren't uh, things that the city in the past has done. Um, I, it was not a, a, a deliberate, uh, you know, flying under the radar for the project. Uh, I, I think you make some good points on how we can improve communications in the future. We're videoing this for YouTube. I'll fast forward to this bit right here uh, and talk with the communications director about how we can yeah, <laughs> improve this for future basic. projects. I think it's I used to work but in a yes. corporate environment. It's a pretty basic public relations, customer we're, we're service, communication exercise. Increasing our, our um, level of professional sophistication daily within the city. And, right. and I think this is a learning exercise. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, no, I think that's fine. Yeah, that's good. Point of clarification. My husband was a long-term alderman and what great. If you remember Tom Taylor, if he was here right now, he would be aghast at what the remark you just made. And I'm angry on behalf of him and also on behalf of Bob McWatters. In years past, the Board of Aldermen, your representative, would do the leafleting himself. Okay? They took that out of the Board of Aldermen's hands. Now we have every other organization going on around here. But I really do find that affrontive. And um, I'm more concerned. I'm sorry I haven't been here. I've been, I've been in Florida for the past few months, but we have had no leaflets, leaflets delivered to my house. Um, and the other thing is I'm really concerned that you're trying to solve a problem and creating a lot of other problems. And as far as not, you know, taking whatever kind of x-rays or whatever you do of the houses around the neighborhood, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know how to quote all these things. I know I have a cousin 
that the that her <coughs> building's foundation was was severely handicapped a few years later, mm -hmm. and the developer was long gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was a, a it was an area of development right near her, and it was a major development. And then there there was a sinkhole. <laughs> and coming from Florida, I'm really concerned about that mm -hmm. because I know that um, there's, there are potential areas of some subsurface e surface damage even within mm -hmm. our own city mm -hmm. I, and there has been a sinkhole mm -hmm. right, down in Union Square and I know that in Florida they they utilize I guess the GPR and the mm -hmm. is it the CRT and they're really some kind of equipment that they use to um, do studies on the topographical areas and I'm wondering if that if any of that has been taken into consideration because that's a pretty large tank and then you're talking about building something over it and what's going to happen and what's going to happen to the integrity of the neighborhood. So, you know, that's what I'm concerned about. And even when you talk about the secant pile, I guess it is like a wall from my own understanding. And what can happen? I know there's water that can come in through there and you're talking about the, you know, the Miller River. You know, it seems like that we're constantly trying to um, subterverge nature in everything yeah. we do instead yeah. of working with nature. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I really don't, I'm not an engineer, I have no engineering background, but those are some of my concerns. And especially what you said about, you know, notices being given. They were very well given because I helped my husband leaflet and he did a lot of it on his own and um, he had neighbors help him. And he did everything he could to outreach and to make sure they were in public places to be able to be seen. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the legal thing is a point of consternation. Like, Louisa personally did it, I personally did it, Brian personally did it. We all personally stuck flyers on doorknobs and doors um, throughout the entire area. So, so to see only two hands go up that you actually received them, um, unless they're rolling down uh, in the wind, I don't know where they went. And I think by contrast, a great example is Jackie Rossetti's outreach when there's when the, there was a suspect roaming around Cambridge and roaming yeah. around Somerville. I got a text message, I got a robocall, and I got an email. <coughs> Any snow emergency, same thing. It's in effect. Text message, robocall, email. And thus far, it's been the policy to not send the the blast for meetings like this. It has been. A conscious decision. Like this. this is about getting in touch with people that literally live 15 points away from a five-year construction project. I don't disagree with you on on the the use of the or non-use of the technology. Or the mail. Like that's, yes. that's as old as the sewer system that we already have. And got, you know, just, just to say that you know the communications that has gotten worse. I, I or you know. We got plenty of information about um, other projects that were not in our cell. Assembly Square, we've been inundated with information from other things that have been going mm -hmm. on in the city. And um, just how, how did you get that information? Uh, I'm Brian, I'm, I'm the assistant director. Um, so we, we've been hearing you guys about this. And I'm, as much as it disheartens me to hear that you're not getting the pamphlets, the good side is, is that you're not getting the pamphlets. So we need to come up with a better solution to provide you guys notification. So I think the mail. Mail, okay. Mail, mail is great. Mail is, mail is good. A absolutely. Absolutely. So we can talk to them and see if they want to revise their approach on doing those, these robocalls. I mean, because trust me, Rich and I are going to go to the communications department tomorrow and be like, we got beat up about flyering. If you don't want to get beat up about fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. So this is an opportunity to provide better communication. This woman was just talking about this response. Um, to me, gets me all fired up as you can hear. I get heated, and I shouldn't even speak at things like this because I I can't. Um, but I think this is this is exactly what she was speaking about, where instead of saying we're really sorry the communication hasn't been that good and it's remarkable that there's a room full of people here who are both direct abutters and indirect abutters who have not received anything we're going to do better it's wow we're getting beat up against fl about flyering i think our expectations have changed about you know and and 
that's exactly the kind of conflict that I think we're, we're doing to each other. You know, I'm getting heated, I'm, and it's just, it's, it's not productive. <laughs> And also that it's a, it's a conversation about what will happen as opposed to an actual conversation which would be about the possibility of something happening. Right. There, there has never been any attempt by the city to have a conversation with anyone that is going to be actually directly affected by this construction project as to whether or not it should be taking place. Like and we, there's, we have no voice. All we get to do is come here and yell at you guys. And we know <laughs> that it's not actually up to you. You guys didn't. You're just doing your job. You, somebody said, figure this okay. out. You said, okay, no problem. I'll figure that out. You did a good job figuring out that one specific it. thing. The, the problem is that it's not actually the, the rest of the problem. There's, and like you said, it's a piece. It's a piece of the puzzle. Well, this is a piece of this project. We, as neighbors and constituents and are a piece of this. We are. Current, current constituents. <laughs> constituents that actually already live in the city. And have been here for 25 years. You know, years. It's, it's, this is a piece of it. Just like, you know, all of the other pieces. And it also shouldn't just be about it. Yes. And the only reason I knew about it is because one of you lo lovely people came up to me at the dog park and said, did you know this was happening? And I said, no. So, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> you need to inform the whole city because it impacts everyone. Oh, thank you. I think the poster for this meeting I personally put out. It's about 8.30 right now. Um, I want to ask Rob King, who's the Director of Capital Projects, to say a couple of words about next steps in this project. And then um, Alderman McWatters would also like to say a couple of words. Um, and I, I do want to thank you for being here today. It's been a long two hours, very educational one I, on both sides. So I do appreciate uh, giving your time. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I apologize for being late tonight. I was actually at Finance Committee discussing a couple other items uh, and got here right after that meeting. So my name is Rob King. I'm Director of Capital Projects and Planning for the City. Um, I think it's clear tonight that we still have work to do, right? There are still questions. Uh, the questions that you guys have, uh, I want to make it clear you do have a voice. Uh, your Ward Alderman is sitting back there, and he is your voice. Um, without his support, this project goes nowhere. So if you continue to have questions, if you continue to have concerns, please feel free to reach out to Alderman McWaters. Uh, there are Aldermen at large that you can also expect your, express your concerns to. Again, we have work to do. It's our job to deliver the solutions to problems that are occurring in the city. And if we haven't done that the right way yet, or if there is additional information we need to provide, that's for us to do. And it's for you to ask the questions, and it's for us to answer them. So we still have to do that. I think the next steps, uh, there's a presentation that's going to be before the board Thursday evening on infrastructure in general. I think Rich explained earlier that it's probably going to be somewhat similar to the one he gave earlier, but just longer. Uh, if you want to come that evening, please, we'd love to have you there. Uh, we're going to be talking about this project and a couple others that work to solve some of these long-term problems we have in the city. But again, if, if you have concerns about this or those, it's important that the aldermen hear from you at that meeting. So. Uh, that's going to be the next step. We're going to be doing the project discussion with the board at that meeting. At a subsequent Board of Aldermen meeting, if the board wishes, we'll discuss financing mechanisms to support these projects. But again, we're working to support the boards, to answer the board's questions about how this stuff moves forward. It's ultimately their vote that makes that happen. So uh, I, if there are questions that come up after this meeting, I'd say to grab a card from Rich, Brian, myself, anybody, from, anybody up here that represents city staff. We'll make sure to get your questions answered, uh, either via email or at a subsequent meeting. Um, and if, if there aren't any other items to discuss, I'd, I'd love to bring the alderman back up just to close things off. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And I hear you loud and clear. And I just want to make one thing clear. I represent the neighborhood. Uh. Yep. And I also hear that the process, you feel like you weren't involved from day one. We weren't. And <coughs> this is not to minimize the hard work that's going into this project, but I kind of agree. This project was just uh, brought before this ward 
in incremental steps, and they wanted us to, to um, basically look, look at, we have an infrastructure problem in the city, we all know that. But the process should have been, as someone pointed out, we should have been involved a year before, eight months before, have neighborhood meetings, meet with the planning staff, to figure out if this would be feasible to fit this neighborhood. <coughs> I feel like we're in an impasse right now. Um, in order for this project to go forward, it's going to be, have to be bonded out. They're going to have to need eight votes. Eight all of them have to vote for this. Um, at this point, I'm listening to the neighbors, and right now, I have to say, I'm not in favor of this project as it stands. So. <laughs> I want to work with the administration and the neighbors to see if we can come up with alternatives. But right now, this is going to be my, my major concern also, if it did go through seven to seven for seven days a week, that's a lot. Especially on Saturday, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I think that's intrusive, and I think that would, would really wouldn't work for, for, the, for that neighborhood. Now, I grew up in the city, and I know there's flooding all over the city, but we got a lot of big item tickets right now that we're facing. We're facing a diff possibly in Union Square. We got the green line. We just appropriated money for the high school. So we got a lot of money here that we're going to have to uh, appropriate and bond out. So, you know, we got to take a look at all these items and make a determination whether or not this fits. So I do appreciate the hard work that's been put into this. But I also understand the abutters. This is going to be a three to four year nightmare if it gets approved. And quality of life, it's, I mean, you can mitigate it and have, you know, people assigned to work with the neighbors, but there are also unforeseen issues that always happen. And uh, at, at this time, I'm not too sure if uh, they can get eight votes on this, but I'm not an obstructionist either. I want to work with the neighbors. I want to work with the administration. If we can't come up with a solution, then we got to go back to the drawing board. So that's how I see it. Can I just ask, um, how did the alderman, um, from a process point of view, if, if you, like, do you individually solicit from your constituents in your ward feedback on the various projects that come across the transom? So that when, you, when you go to the alderman meeting, you can say, I've, reached out to X number of my constituents, and this is how they, you know, 20% love it, 80% hate it, or whatever the numbers look like? Yes, we can do that. Okay. Um, I believe when they come before us Thursday, it's just for the plan and the appropriation. I'm not too sure. And uh, would it be at that point, after a meeting like that, that would then go the into committee. would do the reach out? It would, have outreach, to, sorry? it would go into a committee, and it would be probably finance, since it's, if they're looking for a specific appropriation, right. It would go into a subcommittee, and that's when we would debate it. But how do you decide whether you're going to vote for or against? That's when we have, it'll be vetted in subcommittee. The alderman who are assigned to that committee, and I'll be involved because it's in my ward. Right. We'll meet with the planning staff, neighbors invited, the public meetings, and this whole process is vetted again. So the primary way to get the neighbors involved, the constituents involved, is through attendance at public meetings? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Could I make a point of